again, we're so excited to welcome our guest speakers for tonight, Dr. Clifford and Joyce Henner. Yes, they are sexual therapists, ed educators, and authors of, get this, 11 books. 11 books. A lot, 11 books. <laughs> <laughs> Their most recent books are Enjoy, The Gift of Sexual Pleasure for Women, uh -huh. and then my favorite, I think, Married Guys Die to Great Sex. Let me order about four of those. I'm going to pass them around to my buddies. <laughs> they work together as a team, counseling individuals and couples, leading sexual enhancement seminars for couples, and teaching sex education for preteens and their parents. And they also work together as a team, speaking with men's and women's groups, lecturing at universities, and training fellow professionals throughout the world. Joyce is a clinical nurse specialist, and Cliff is a clinical psychologist. Yes. <laughs> the Penners are best known for their pioneered work in encouraging people of all faiths to connect their sexuality with their belief system, helping them embrace sex as a good and, and God-giving gift, right? Yeah. Opening the topic of sexuality within churches of many denominations, yo. Yeah, this I'm is so excited. This <laughs> is going to be so good. So without further ado, we just want to introduce to our Victory family, Joyce and Cliff Penner. Woo! Thank you, thank you. We're always not a bit nervous about talking about sex, but we're really nervous about whether all this technical stuff is going to work. So um, <laughs> we're hoping to get our PowerPoint slides up and running, and, uh, and then we'll dive in on this topic. So we're ready for that. There we go. Okay. Can you see it? Now we can see our PowerPoint, but not us. So let's, where did you go? Mm -hmm. I can't see my, I got a, a V, here we go. I think we got it. Okay. Can you hear us? Good. Let's dive in. It's really an unusual thing to think about the fact that here we are, two people who were both raised in the Mennonite community. Where sex was not talked about. So for us to be the ones who were called to bring healthy sexuality into the church community is quite an unusual happening. Just so that you have a little background, as I mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist and was in practice in Pasadena where we live. And Joyce was a nursing professor 45 years ago when I was asked to teach a group of women about sex. And because it was all women, because Joyce was a professor, I prevailed upon her to join me. And that's really got us started in going around the world talking about sex. We became certified then as sexual therapists and have found it massively rewarding to be helping couples get in touch with their sexuality. Whether we're working with individuals and in discovering wholesome sexuality or with couples and finding new and more positive ways to relate sexually, it has been very rewarding. And whether couples come kind of as a last ditch effort then to have years of pain in their background and get help and rediscover a healthy sex life or a newly married couple comes for just a few sessions to work out some minor adjustments. The reward is incredible. Throughout our time today, we're going to be uh, receiving your text questions. So if you want to jot down this number, you can text us questions and we'll answer them at various points along the way. That number is also on your outline right at the top. And if you have your outline handy, we will be following it and going in that order. So let's dive in. Our first and most convincing, oops, something happened. There you go. Good. Our first and most convincing finding over the 45 years is that it is men who make the difference because of in a intimacy, uh, 
building relationship. And the reason is because we as men are um, kind of central to the idea of, of how we function sexually because we have a, a set mind in terms of how we think about this. And, uh, and the man getting things started is uh, what this revolves around, whether there is a problem or not. He really can make a difference in building the intimacy and keeping passion alive in marriage. And that may not sound fair that it's up to the man and he does have a harder task than the woman does. But because men are simpler than women and men are much more like a stick shift. Yeah, shift we often make that comparison that a man is, is very much like a stick shift Chevy pickup truck, very reliable and, and predictable, whereas the woman is much more like a, a Maserati. We're great when we're running, but we may spend a lot of time in the shop getting tuned to, in uh, order to run. The Maserati is always needing fine tuning. And, and so uh, we have to, as men, be really aware of this. And part of the reason for this is that women function on two tracks, both the emotional and the physical. And those tracks have to be in sync in order for us to open up sexually and to be able to move toward our husbands and also enjoy our responses. Whereas we as men tend to function on one track. When we're physically aroused, we're usually ready emotionally. This is why we often have this expression, you know, men have a one track mind. Well, what's the reason for that? It's because we only have one track. So. <laughs> Um, it's really important for us to get that difference. And that is why the husband, when he loves his wife and adores her and connects with her, his affirmation ignites her passion. She invites him sexually, he feels love, and they both end up happy. So it really is a win-win when the husband is the one who makes the difference by getting with his wife where she is. And this is the model of Christ in the church. We taught about it in Ephesians. Well, I wanted to back up, though, for one thing, Joyce, that, that I'd like to mention. Okay. And that is that the, one of the differences between men and women is that women desire sex and open up sexually when they feel deeply loved and connected with and shared with, with their husbands. Whereas we as men often feel loved through sex and and end up feeling like we are loved because we were able to make that sexual connection. And that's connection. why it works best when the man starts by getting with her. Yeah. And now let's look at the model that we learn in scripture about Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 25 says, Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her. And then it goes on and says, and this is how husbands ought to love their wives, bringing the best out of her. Exactly and, and from a man's perspective, bringing the best out of her means that she's turned on and wants more. <laughs> and we've developed this whole concept in our book, The Married Guy's Guide to Great Sex. The book that Corey wants to order four copies of. Yes, and that we really developed that and looked much more at what scripture talks about. How does Christ love the church? And when you look at Philippians chapter 2, it talks about that Christ gave up his rights in order to get with us. He became human, which is a very humbling process in order to love us exactly where we are. And similarly, when the man is willing to give up his rights to get with her, that is when there can be that, that blending of the two where they really can come together. But for this formula to work leads to our second finding, and that's that the woman needs to be able to listen to her body and lead with her sexuality. Now we got to explain, what, what on earth do we mean by that? And we find that for passion in marriage, a woman needs to be able to take. She needs to be able to believe she is worthy of his touch and has the right to be intensely sexual. She has to know her body was designed not only for reproduction, 
for making babies, but also for sexual pleasure and satisfaction. And when she accepts her God-given sexuality, it is then that she can leave with her sexuality, not with demand, not with any kind of pressure or control, but by listening to her body, taking in the good feelings of being touched, and then inviting him to enjoy her body, even as she enjoys his and enjoys his touch. And, and we believe that this works best because a turned on man is, a turned on woman. I mean, a turned on woman, yeah, is usually a turn on to a man. And on the contrary, a turned on man can often be experienced as a demand or pressure for the woman. And that's important to remember. Often men don't think of it because when she's turned on, it is great for him. So she, they think if I'm turned on, it must be good for her, but it doesn't tend to work that way. Women can easily say they feel used. Men kind of want to say, use me. He <laughs> says, uh, they're, you're eager for that kind of connection. You have to remember that nothing turns on a man more than a turned on woman. And this, when this system is put into practice, the man getting with the woman where she is, and the woman getting with her sexuality and sharing it with him, it is then that sex keeps interesting because it is the woman that keeps it interesting. And we have developed that in the book that partners with the Married Guys Guide to Great Sex called Enjoy, the gift of sexual pleasure for women. And it really is a gift given by God. So let's try to summarize what we're trying to say. We really believe that it is the combination of the man's constancy, his simplicity, his predictability, and the woman's ever-changing complexity that keeps the sexual life alive throughout a marriage. We have so, some fun pictures of this from the internet, which many of you may have seen. Uh, somebody wrote how, how many, or how to satisfy a woman every time. There are 250 things it says to do here, and then right at the end it says, and then go back and do it again. Slight exaggeration, but there's some truth to it. And that is why the man does have a tougher job. And then we ask, okay, what does it take to satisfy a man? And Quite that's, easy. that's very simple. Um, and somebody else said, well, just show up. Um, but uh, uh, this is an important thing we'd love for you to talk about with each other. Another way it's been pictured, you've saw, probably seen this, where there's a uh, one switch, on-off switch for the man, and all these buttons to adjust for the woman. So uh, again, it may be different. Maybe you're the exact opposite, and the woman has an on-off switch, and the man has many adjustments, but the great majority look like this. And so we really believe that as the man accepts and understands, respects, and goes with the woman's complexity, he shifts his natural drive to compete, conquer, achieve, score, reach a goal, to, he shifts that to her need for connection and enjoyment. And then since the man is never truly satisfied, unless the woman is, he has to go her way. And I want to pause there a minute and just say, um, it's very important for, for women to understand this. I think women often believe that, that the man's happy as long as he gets his ejaculation and has his orgasm and that's, that's all he needs. Yeah, there's some satisfaction in that, obviously, but the real satisfaction comes when he knows that that she has enjoyed it and she has found pleasure and she has found fulfillment. Ultimately, her way will work best for both of them. Sex will be more interesting, less results oriented, less pressure filled, more total person, and more deeply satisfying long term. So what are we saying here? We're saying that when the man gets with the woman and the sexually and the when the woman gets with herself sexually, that's the best combination. Rather than thinking that somehow the, the man is going to somehow pressure or engage or, or hassle the woman into responding, what's really going to work is when she gets with herself 
as he gets with her. Now we want to go to your questions and uh, we'll just read them and answer them as we come to them. Some of them we will save till a later part in our talk because they fit there. What spiritual value is it for me and my spouse to go through the pain, shame, anxiety, and fears to bring sexual freedom and having a fulfilling sex life <clears throat> in this stage of our Christian marriage. We've been married over 30 years. Our sex life remains status quo, no novelty, and truthfully born sexual pleasure. <clears throat> and walking with the Lord seems like such a dichotomy and holds us back. Well, we would encourage you, for example, to um, do some things that would, would bring some new information and new spark into your life. One of the things we like to have couples do is um, read a book out loud together. For example, I don't know whether that was written by a man or a woman, but um, but reading Enjoy, the gift of sexual pleasure for women out loud together would be a, a great way to add something new. And it would also help you understand that our, our sexual pleasure is heartily endorsed by the scriptures, not something that's part of our sinful self, our fleshly self, our worldly self, but rather uh, sexual pleasure is an assumption that is made throughout scripture as a God-given part of our relationship. So we would encourage you to, to do something that stretches that uh, as you work together on it. Another question? How does, I'm just going to this one. How does the woman get with herself to enhance their sexual life? Excellent question. It really helps if we understand our body and do some reading and the book Enjoy the Gift of Sexual Pleasure for Women will help you with that. But there are other ways, just if you don't get the book, to listen to yourself throughout the day and just be aware of any kind of little tingles and thank God for them. And let your husband know when you're thinking about him. Think throughout the day of positive times you've had together and Keep that in the forefront of your mind. That, and that again, when you answer these things quickly like this, you can't say it all, but hopefully it will help. How is a wife you overcome zero sex drive, especially if sex is painful? We'll be getting to talking about painful sex in a bit, but that would that be a kill. Th that, yeah. Yeah, painful sex will kill a sex drive. Mm -hmm. And so the first step, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, is dealing with that pain. Single parenting and restoring purity. That's a big question. And uh, dealing with your sexuality as an individual, thanking God for it, making active decisions about what you do with it, how you handle it, and connecting that in a positive way. But it's important that we not turn off our sexual feelings because what that tends to do then is when we are in a place where we can get into a, a blessed sexual relationship, uh, it's hard to turn the feelings back on. So the answer isn't to turn off your sexual feelings, but rather to be grateful for them and make wise decisions about what you do with those feelings. Another question related to that. Where can I seek scriptures that express redemption after divorce and reduce stigma of desiring to be remarried and have hope of and have hope of ending years of celibacy? Right. You know that's a that's a giant question. I, I think uh, what I would want to do with that question, I would want to refer you to the the uh, counselors on your step. If you're from from Victory Church, who's sponsoring the seminar, I would want to refer you to them. For that answer because that's a, a giant one that I don't think you can answer here. Well, and just the basic message is Christ does forgive us. That was his death on the cross was a message of giving his life up to forgive us. And yes, his ideal is not divorce, but his forgiveness is there and we can be redeemed and become whole. Mm -hmm. I think that'll be it for now. 
by the way, I'm realizing that we're not going to get to answer all these questions. No, but I will have time. them on my phone. So anything we don't get answered, we'll make sure we text you in response. Is it okay for a wife to initiate sex or should it be the husband? Oh, by all means. There's it nothing be the wife. There's there's nothing that is makes a man feel better usually than when the woman says, Hey, you want to fool around tonight? Um, that's going to uh, usually make him very happy. So uh, don't never hesitate on that. And there's no right or wrong there. In fact, if you want a model of this, read the Song of Solomon where she gets all turned on and keeps telling him, come on, let's get going. You're going too slow. Uh, so uh, one more and then we'll get back to our text. What are some tips for the man not to feel bad or take it to heart when the woman isn't pleased, which may be a result of her not knowing herself sexually? And that is, that's why, as you, you mentioned, the man's role will be more difficult if she isn't able to get with herself. And both of those have to be worked on and talked about together. My assumption in that question is that the, the woman who wrote that is not able to experience orgasm and that this makes the man feel like a failure. This is something that you can work on together um, it, because all of us were designed for orgasms ultimately, but there's usually been stuff in our life that comes along that gets in the way of that. And we'll refer you to a, a, another resource that might be helpful with that uh, called Restoring the Pleasure. Um, we better keep going or we'll run yes, out of time yes. here. Yes, let's do it. So the third finding is that mutuality is the key to a satisfying sexual relationship in marriage. Sex has to be as good for one as it is for the other if it's going to be good for a lifetime. Yeah, it can't be that, that the woman is providing a sexual outlet for the man and that, that this, is, this is what uh, her job is, but rather it has to be as good for her as the other. And the Bible talks about this too. 1 Corinthians 7 from the message says the married bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife, the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not the place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a, de a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. And this is a basic biblical teaching about the need for mutuality and, and Nowhere does it talk about uh, that it's just the woman's job to keep the man at home and happy. And that doesn't work. We're very convinced of that. Our fourth finding is that passion in marriage will only last if pleasure or enjoyment is the goal. And I think this will help answer some of your questions that we were trying to answer. When we're focused on arousal, intercourse, and orgasm, that often gets in the way of pleasure and enjoyment. If we can have pleasure, enjoyment, and satisfaction, whether or not those happen, then it works a lot better. No, it is true that arousal and, and intercourse and orgasm uh, are very wonderful. Will, yeah. They're wonderful and uh, often may be a, a result of what goes on in the enjoyment and the pleasure, the touching and caressing. But the success of a sexual experience should not be measured by uh, having achieved one of those goals, getting an erection, keeping an erection, uh, having an orgasm or having 12 orgasms. That doesn't determine success. What really determines success is two people have connected, are close, are feeling intimate, are feeling warm, deeply uh, experiencing, experiencing the love with one another. And when we focus on the results, the orgasm, the arousal, the intercourse, then those are involuntary responses, the arousal and the, the orgasm. If we focus on those, our mind gets in the way of those happening, our goal orientation, our watching, monitoring, seeing, is it going to work this time? that keeps it from working. When we relax and enjoy each other and focus on the enjoyment and the pleasure, then those responses are much more likely to happen. But there may be times in life where they don't happen because of something physical in our body, because of hormonal imbalance, uh, because of pain, 
And so then we have to find other ways to enjoy each other. And as we age, things change. And so when we're focused on those results, that really uh, narrows our world of sexual enjoyment. And one of the things that has to happen then when we're gonna be focused on pet pleasure means we have to focus on slowing down, especially we as men, uh, to take the time to enjoy the moment and, and soak in the sensations. Some of you um, may remember the, the Pointer Sisters song, The Woman Loves the Man with the Slow Hands. Well, they that, may not have been around when that song was popular. But, <laughs> but in sex, slow is always better than fast, uh, especially uh, when it comes to bringing the woman pleasure and we as men tend to want to get to our goal real fast, and that doesn't always work well, out all that well. It's interesting because in the world, the faster you get to your goal, the more successful you are. So here we're saying you have to just reverse that and do exactly the opposite in bed. Well, and then there's another thing. A lot of men, first, first sexual experiences were as a result of masturbation, and usually they were doing that to do it as quickly as they could before they got caught or somebody walked in the bathroom or wherever. And uh, so a lot of us as men practice that very early in our life. To be fast. To be fast. And then, and then when we get married, we're supposed to slow down and, and enjoy the journey. And uh, so that's a real shift that has to take place for us. So our fifth finding is that for the woman to be able to take a lead, for the man to connect with and affirm his wife, and to both be able to delight in the pleasure of each other's bodies, it's necessary to take the time, allow the space, and do the work of he healing from hurts. And we're going to talk about five issues that are most prevalent interruptions of a mutually satisfying sex life and give a few tips about what to do about that. The first area we'll go to is this whole area of pain. Sex is designed for pleasure. Painful sex will not be pleasurable. And in fact, painful sex should not be allowed to continue because it takes us down a negative path rather than a, than a joining, wholesome, connecting path. There's no way sex can be enjoyed and be mutual if it's painful. So the first thing we'd recommend is stop any activity that is causing the pain and then seek a pelvic floor physical therapist. Pelvic floor physical therapists are excellent in treating painful intercourse, painful sex. And usually you can find one near you and we will help you with that. If you can't, just contact us through our website or you have our cell and we'll be happy to guide you in that. Most of the time when, when couples report pain, it is the woman who is experiencing that pain. Occasionally it's the man, but the majority, 99% probably is women. And, uh, and sometimes men get the idea, ah, oh, this is all in her head. Uh, the fact is, no, it's in her vagina and that's what's hurting and that's what she is responding to. And there is usually a real reason why she's feeling pain. It's not something that she's created in her head because uh, that would be no fun at all to create pain. No, and pain perpetuates more pain. This cycle of pain starts with the red asterisk there, with, can start with fear and anxiety or previous pain so that the body anticipates pain and then the body automatically tightens the vaginal muscles. I want to use an example. If you're at the dentist chair and you just feel the, the dental assistant pass the needle uh, quietly to the dentist and he's going to give you a, a, a shot in your jaw, um, you probably tighten your grip on the armrests of the dental chair, which then tightens you up and is likely to make it hurt more. Well, that's exactly what happens when there is that anticipation of the pain uh, sexually. And then tightness makes sex painful or even penetration impossible. And that's a condition called vaginismus. And the reason, the most common reason for unconsummated marriage is- An unconsummated marriage is a marriage which 
have not been able to experience sexual intercourse because of the barriers and pain issues that are there for the woman. And that is very treatable. And again, contact us if that happens to be the situation for you. So then the body reacts by bracing more on an ongoing basis and the, the tightness kind of becomes almost a permanent situation and the pain reinforces the fear and the reflex response of tightening. And so then the circle keeps it going. So just hear this clearly. If it hurts, don't do it. And do, find other and, ways and the to reason, do it. The reason for that is because it, it's a downward spiral. The more it hurts, the tighter you get, the worse it gets. And then you dread the experience and you're not going to get aroused and have orgasm if it's hurting. So it's, it's not, going to, not going to be any fun. So the first area we want to underscore is deal with pain and there are ways to deal with it. The next one is past trauma. A person who has experienced sexual abuse in childhood or adolescence or even uh, maybe in adulthood has a pattern of showing high interest in sex before and outside of marriage and then that desire shuts down radically in marriage. Now, you do that. She may have before marriage, see, and it usually it's more the woman, but the man also may have experienced abuse. And she may have seen, you may have felt highly sexual ahead of time. And what happened once you got married, or sometimes it even happened in the weeks before the wedding. And what happens is now in marriage, you feel that being trapped that you felt in the abuse situation. And that's what shuts down the desire. And one of you asked, how do you enjoy sex with your husband when you were abused as a child? And there's some steps you can take. First, probably having to go through some trauma therapy. And again, finding a therapist who can help you with that or your church can probably. And then you may also join a that process, join a group of other women who have had sexual abuse and deal with it in group therapy, but working through the trauma, writing about it repeatedly, writing, 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 till it gets out of your brain and controlling your body and lets you be free of it. But then, even then, it will take, and now while you're working through it, some things you can do. For example, during sex, make sure you have eye-to-eye -eye contact with your husband. Which means that the lights are on in the room. Because when you keep that eye-to-eye -eye contact, it is less likely that your mind is going to wander off to that past abuse. So lights on, eye-to-eye -eye contact. And then if the pictures come in about the abuse, kind of put it on a side screen and keep your focus on your thoughts, feelings, connection with your husband. Talk out loud if that helps. And um, also arrange with your husband some prearranged signals. For example, if something new he makes or action he takes triggers that old abuse, have a way you can pack him or let him know and he can change his activity and that has to be decided on together. But for many people who have abuse in their past, if they haven't dealt with it, it is going to be necessary to, to get some kind of help with that from somebody uh, or a group that really know how to deal with this kind of thing. This is a, a, a giant subject and we're trying to address it here in two minutes, but it is something that you can get past. And if you are in Atlanta, Georgia, where Victory Church is, uh, that is an area that has a very high population of Christian sex therapists because that's where we do the training. And so, you should, we should be able to help you find someone there or the church can. So the first area that we talked about was, was painful sex. The second area was if you have sexual abuse or trauma in your past and how it's affecting your sexual life. And then the third area that we want to talk about is, is when you are, have been raised in an out of control home, ACA, adult child of an alcoholic, or emotionally out of control, a rageaholic, a uh, mentally ill parent, where you had to internalize the need for control far too young. And so in sex, when we let go and have an orgasm, we are the most out of control we ever are in life. For a person 
to internalize the need for control, that's scary. Her home was out of control, his home. And so she doesn't just have a lack of desire. She really fights getting into a sexual experience. But once she gets aroused, she can let go and have an orgasm. Let's explain this graph. You see at the bottom left-hand side, there's resistance, resistance, resistance. But then once her, to getting into it, but then once her body gets turned on, it may be that she's very responsive, has an orgasm. And then as soon as that's over, it drops back down. And what's interesting is immediately the resistance kicks in. She doesn't like that feeling. It, it was early in our experience of doing sexual therapy that we had a number of women at the same time explain this pattern to us. And we found that all of them had uh, alcoholic fathers. So at first we talked about it as the daughter of an alcoholic father syndrome. But then we, as we started to teach about that, we got more and more input that it wasn't just daughters of alcoholic fathers, alcoholism in any either parent, and also other emotionally of out of control, control parents. So um, if that's a pattern that you have, uh, we write about this a good bit in, in Enjoy and, and in Restoring the Pleasure, which we'll talk about in a minute. And there are ways to get past, past this too, but it has to be done deliberately. You can't just talk yourself out of it in no, a moment. In fact, this is a situation where usually we have to encourage the person who is ACA to have sex by decision, not by desire. And over time, talking to yourself and realizing why she's responding this way and what is good about it and how can she enjoy it and realizing hopefully her husband is not an alcoholic or out of control that she can be free with him. So we've talked about pain, talked about trauma or abuse, talked about coming from an out of control family. A fourth category is very common in today's world when uh, there has been an active porn life this is usually the male, uh, or but also uh, women now. Yeah, uh, but where or some other kind of external stimuli, then the re the sexual response gets connected with non-intimate triggers. You see, porn isn't intimate. Face to face, body to body, is what's intimate, and that's that dopamine surge, that that excited love, rather than. Uh, connected oxytocin, deep love of being sexually connected. Yeah, and so um, the brain chemicals that spark that initial attraction are totally different from those that foster lifelong attachment. Uh, Dr. Alan Shore of UCLA has talked about this as excited love, that newness, that, that dopamine-driven, adrenaline-driven, sympathetic nervous system-driven, excitedness that is there in a new relationship. Which is lots of fun. And we can easily get hooked on that, particularly with an external stimulus like pornography. And when we're hooked on that, it's hard to shift to that oxytocin, quiet, long-term attachment, sexual relationship that can last a lifetime. And so we, we talk about that excited love and the quiet love, the dopamine-driven love and the oxytocin uh, kind of connection that is much deeper and, and makes a, a for a lifelong mutual commitment. So now if you experience and come with any of these uh, six patterns, I whatever we talked about, four. sexual therapy may be necessary or some kind of self-help sexual retraining. So let's just talk about sexual therapy. In sexual therapy, we deal with those kind of issues that we just described, as well as the the, the more common issues uh, like lack of desire where one person is not as interested in the other or for women difficulty getting aroused or difficulty having orgasm for men it could be something like premature ejaculation or erectile dysfunction as well as as lack of desire all of those things get dealt with in, in sexual therapy and we write about that and give step-by-step -step help with that in our book, Restoring the Pleasure. And couples who have a pretty good working relationship can often 
tackle these issues and do it through a self-help book like this. And we always recommend starting and seeing if you can do it that way. If not, you may need to get some outside help. A little background here. It is very important to recognize that sexual dysfunctions don't tend to go away by themselves. They are self-perpetuating and tend to, to last long into a marriage and in fact, uh, get maybe get even worse as they go along they don't go away with time and talk therapy like great counseling psychodynamic therapy promotes insight and heals wounds and is necessary in some situations but often even after going through that type of therapy the couple needs to engage in sexual retraining or sex therapy in order to interrupt their negative patterns and retrain the couple to behave. Let me give an example. And communicate and enjoy a mutually satisfying Yeah, we used to kiddingly tease our talk therapist friends that um, somebody could go to therapy twice a week for five years and fully understand why they have erectile dysfunction. They still have erectile dysfunction, but they really understand why they have it. So uh, uh, what's important in sexual therapy is that there be behavior uh, experiences that the couple happens. Most of the work in sexual therapy actually happens with At the home. couple by themselves, not in the office. What goes on in the office is just guiding people through the steps as they uh, go from one experience to the next. And part of that in that process is learning to give and receive touch with no demand. And that's a very important we take them through that. And then there this is a non-demand teaching assignment that we give as part of that process that many couples can do and it's an important one to do at different stages of life like after a baby after a surgery after an illness when anything has changed in your body we encourage you to experiment with each other and communicate what it is that brings pleasure and what it is that brings arousal and what hurts and and what bothers and, and what type of touch you like best, a lighter touch or a heavier touch. And the top diagram is how the woman can guide the man and teach him and discover for herself often what feels good and what doesn't. And then the lower diagram is how the man can teach the woman, especially genital stimulation. And then we can give you a few little tricks to try that are just kind of fun. If you're working on caressing and touching each other and learning just to focus on that touch. And we as men tend to like to touch in straight lines. You know, kind of uh, like this. Whereas women much prefer to be touched in circles. So if you just think about the shape of each of our genitals, that could give you some kind of a clue why that's the case. And then when they learn to be touched in circles, actually like it better. So both touching and being touched in circles does feel better. And then going with the contour of the body rather than a flat hand so that you go with the body and then keeping his pace behind hers and what we mean by that is a lot of times women feel rushed in the experience like they're being pushed into it faster than they're they're ready so if the man can keep his level of arousal his pace behind hers both the intensity and the activity and the couple that we were working with and said oh i know exactly what you mean we go bike riding together and if he keeps his front wheel slightly behind mine we stay together but if he gets ahead of me i get further and further behind and that's the the picture that might be helpful and then kissing daily without leading to sex and we'll talk more about and that. we're talking about passionate kissing mm -hmm. daily uh, when, when you're working on a problem we like to define what the issue is on the left the inhibition the barrier the problem whatever it may be, and then freedom on the right, and think of it not as going to jump from one side to the other, but you're gonna start working at one level, kind of like laying concrete and let that cure and dry, and then you add another level, and, and you do these in small, manageable steps so that the two of you can really uh, be together on this, and, and no one is getting ahead of the other one, and if you feel like you are getting ahead, on one side or the other then you back up and take a half step and if you try a step and it doesn't work break it down more and try again usually if you can't function at the next step it means it's too big a jump 
So she's breaking it down so you can manage that and keep at that level till it's comfortable. Now, I imagine that, that like, from the way the phone is buzzing, yeah. um, that there are a whole bunch of questions here. So let's, uh, let's just start at the top and respond. Yep. Let me just get this open here. Okay, hold on a minute. Just beaming up your questions here. Okay. Is role playing an acceptable stimulus for married couples in dealing with a struggle of quiet versus excited love? I, I have a, my immediate response is if the two of you are in agreement on it. If we're, you enjoy it together, if it isn't one doing it for the other. Yeah, what we often find is that, that one person will push this and the other kind of begrudgingly goes along with it. That doesn't work because that doesn't go with the mutuality. But if both are, are interested in it and having fun and it brings you together, by all means. And it, it, one thing that often happens, it's the husband wanting the wife to role play what he's seen in pornography and that doesn't work. That doesn't build intimacy, that keeps the pornography going. Uh, what are some tips if there is no building up to sex every time? Taking, we're gonna talk about that in a minute with our formula for intimacy, so let's get to that after that. What if your partner doesn't kiss passionately at all? Uh, well, let's just, let's just respond to that. Um, one of the one of the exercises that we have that was the hardest one to write in our book, Restoring the Pleasure, is a kissing exercise that that gets couples together. And and we strongly believe that kissing is a good barometer of of the connection between a husband and and wife, of man and woman. And so it is very important that a kissing be a good part of the experience. So in that experience that we outline in Restoring the Pleasure, we take the couple can step by step how they can learn about kissing and all that and and but you have to keep in mind there may be reasons why the kissing is avoided it could be that there was abuse involved with kissing in the past it could be that you come from a culture that that doesn't kiss um so you need to be dealing with out loud talking with it. those things talking it through and then working on it step by step, just, just like we had shown in, in this a few minutes ago. Another one is, what if your spouse laughs at the faces you make during sex, which makes you into feel insecure? That would be something to really talk about because the faces are a beautiful expression of the sexual response. When a, when a person has an orgasm, uh, and it's true for men or women, it's almost inevitable that they're heavy breathing and uh, sighing, uh, gasping, um, opening eyes, closing eyes, making faces. That is part of the orgasmic response. Now, the laughter may actually be an enjoyment laughter rather than making fun that's, of laughter. That's interesting, or a set of consciousness. So that would be something to talk about. And to again, in restoring the pleasure, we have an exercise of acting out the breathing and sounds of a sexual response, including the facial uh, the face, facial grimaces. So that might be an exercise for the two of you. We would, wouldn't suggest that you handle it by turning off the lights or putting a pillow over your head. No. Um, because there is, there is something intimate about that, mm -hmm. and we want to help people enjoy that. Is it possible to have a deep sexual connection without an emotional connection? Not really. There's that you can have intense sex that's dopamine driven, and that can produce erotic satisfaction, but that tends to wear off over time, and the person needs to keep changing the source of stimulation or the person in order to keep that. Well, you going. see, we would call that that. Uh, pictured in the Playboy mentality, where, where, um, and Hugh Hefner was the model of that, so that he wanted to, he made a good sexual connection, according to him, uh, with this person, and then 18 months later, uh, moved on to the next person, because 
they were wanting to, he was wanting to keep that kind of a connection going that was about the erotic without the emotional, relational, spiritual connection. I think we've talked about this, but let's just emphasize it. I feel like my desire for sex is higher than my wife's. wife's. She's is sometimes moody or even on her period and doesn't want to have sex or please me. We don't think sex is about pleasing the husband, so let's talk about that. She ends up pleasing me, but she does it reluctantly. Any advice for us? We would say this is where the husband is to love his wife like Christ loves the church and get with her where she is. And if, she, if it's about the husband's neediness, it will stifle sexual desire for the wife long term. It's got to be him getting with her where she is and uh, not pushing your desire on her. But, but the idea that, that she's there to please you um, almost inevitably will, well, cre will create distance rather than intimacy. It doesn't fulfill the mutuality we talked about that is taught throughout the scripture. My wife likes sex with lights either off or dimmed down. She says she feels embarrassed. What do you think this is? It could be those facial grimaces and intense sexual responses. And again, well, one thing I'd want to quickly jump in with, uh, women often somehow think that, that those responses are a negative, but in fact, they are a turn on for the man and the man. Well, use, most of the time, use, I mean, sure it could be different, but generally well, speaking, the, 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 they are a part of the man's enjoyment. So if, if that'd be a good thing to talk about as to how he feels about that. And then um, I suppose if you want to go those, those steps, you can turn up the, get, a, get, the get a dimmer switch for your yeah. bedroom and turn up the lights gradually until you know, you've got spotlights. <laughs> and, uh, it doesn't have to be spotlights, but no, I'm it can be, I know, I know. Is it normal for a man not to want to have sex? Yes. Men lack desire just as women lack desire. And there is usually some reason for that. I, I Just to use two big categories, the most common one would be something that happened in their past that, that set them up for that. A second one would be uh, that they are getting their uh, sexual gratification apart from the marriage, like in porn or somewhere else. And a third one could be a hormonal issue uh, where there is uh, some massive testosterone deprivation that is occurring. And again, we don't know what age this person is, but that's more likely to happen in older ages. But uh, yeah, men struggle with desire all the time. And just like with women, there are usually reasons behind it. I believe my husband is verbally abusive and he says hurtful words and the next hour he wants to have sex. I am far from it. It is not that I'm holding sex as punishment. I'm just hurt and not interested. I don't know how to welcome his advances after that. Talking with him about it, I get vilified even more. I just keep quiet and upset. I believe it interferes with my walk with the Lord. We would highly recommend you get some third person help in this. Yeah, this would be a, an ideal situation for you to seek some marriage counseling where where this got dealt with out loud. Obviously, um, there's something in his background that sets him up for this, whether it's what kind of a family he grew up in or what he saw his father do or or some kind of hurt he's had. I'm not trying to excuse it, just saying there is a reason why he's behaving this way. And uh, the only way in our view, that you're going to be able to get past this is to get into some kind of marital counseling together that would really precede the sexual yeah, counseling. Right. That's where talk therapy would be necessary. My husband struggles with all forms of true intimacy. I've talked to him about ideas for years and encouraged him to do his own research because I feel like I'm telling him how to do things and don't want that. How can I encourage him to go into intimacy with me? without getting mentally exhausted. 
Well, I think we're going to talk about that when we yeah, get to our formula for intimacy, so aren't we? Too, because but, that's really about right. building intimacy, unless you have something you want to quickly say. Yeah. Well, I I would think reading a book out loud together, yeah, working this is one of some steps. One of the things we, we keep saying, read a book out loud together, uh, because what that does is it, it gets you saying the words and ideas, and you can say, oh, that's me, or no, I don't feel that at all, or it isn't that you have to agree with the book, and nor does it mean that everything in the book is, is right. It only means that it's opening the conversation between you, which is then going to begin to build some intimacy. But we'll talk about that more when we get to our formula for intimacy in the book. Yeah, how do I get my husband to be more interested in sex? Again, by getting with your sexuality and sharing it with him, but not with demand or control. But and if in that case he's still not interested, then then you may need to then get it would be interesting to understand what's behind that lack of interest. Was that always there in the marriage, or has it become that? Or has something else interfered with it? Is there another relationship? There are twenty different questions we'd want to ask there. Um, We got some questions here, and I'm just wondering if we should move. To, let's move on. How are we doing? Okay. Okay. Let's, let's answer a couple few, more. A few more, and then we'll move on and answer more at the end if we have time. If not, if we do not answer your question, we will answer it tomorrow uh, by text. And if you, we still don't answer it, then send it again because maybe we missed it. Um, what if your partner, or we got that already, what are some tips if there is no building up about that? Is it okay to lay beside your spouse naked and they not be aroused? Dropping hints without saying, this happens sometimes. Well, a man laying beside a woman naked usually is not a turn on. Usually a woman is a turn on to a man, but sometimes it might not, it might be a demand. Then how long does it take to know your partner sexually fully, or does it change? We've it been, changes forever. We've been married <laughs> for 120 years, and uh, 57 to be exact, and it still changes. We still talk to each other. We talk, teach about mm -hmm. sex, talk with people about sex all day long, every day. Teach seminars like this, and yet we are constantly learning about each other and learning new things about sex. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a biblical analogy in this too. Um, Paul talks about this in the fifth chapter of Ephesians where he talks about it, it being a great mystery, what both our sexual relationship and the relationship of Christ in the church. And, and what is a mystery? A mystery that is something that is in the process of being revealed, but never fully revealed. And uh, so uh, we think of it as a lifetime uh, now we get some things down, you know, some things I absolutely hate yes. and some things I absolutely love and those kind of things, but there's always Even more learning. can change sometimes, yeah. yeah. One so more. one question here, after a C-section, I noticed the sensation has changed. I would, I'm not reading the whole question, but I would suggest strongly first, maybe talking with your OBGYN about that, but then seeing a pelvic floor physical therapist about it and seeing there may be some muscular change that's going on. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna interrupt the questions now to continue because we wanna talk next about our, our sixth finding, and last. Uh, which is that sex is a lot more fun when you're intentional about it. What we mean by that is that you plan for it rather than push for spontaneity. Our culture pushes spontaneity, and spontaneity works great before marriage and early in marriage and outside of marriage and on vacation or in the movies or, or on the internet. But in terms of a long-term sexual relationship in marriage. Build on the oxytocin bonding connection. Uh, the anticipation of planned times together actually builds the quality of those times. So that if we it, know we're going to get together Thursday night, um, there can be that anticipation of that time. And we, you might say, let's pause there a moment, because I can hear the question coming, what if I'm not turned on on Thursday night? You don't have to be turned on. If it's time to be together, to enjoy each other, 
to be intimate and it may lead to turn on, it may not lead to turn on. But you're setting that aside that time to connect and be close physically and intimately. And we find not only does that anticipation build the quality, but the allotment of those times actually increases the quantity. The couples that argue for spontaneity when we get with how frequently they're together are, are often not together all that much because they're waiting to be spontaneous. <laughs> Do a lot of waiting and not much having sex. But it is interesting to us when couples come for sexual therapy and we talk about planning and building time and making time for the sexual therapy exercises and they say, oh no, we wouldn't do that. And then we find out when they last had sex and it was six months ago. And yet they're waiting for spontaneity and holding out for that. So we encourage you not to hold out for spontaneity. If it's working for you, great, enjoy it. But for most of us, once we have children, especially, and as different things happen in life, it really does make it a much better experience when we plan for it. Yeah, when we are, when we are deliberate, uh, intentional in getting with the idea that, that this is something like all the rest of our life we plan, and this is important too. And this is because after the newness phase, many no longer feel that spark or driven desire they felt early in their relationship. It's common to have stopped kissing passionately just for the sake of kissing, and so that tends to decrease the desire. We may have encountered some physical cherry changes, like the woman who with the C-section, that interfere with um, how we functioned when we were earlier or when we were younger. It may be that we've learned somewhere along one of us to respond to external stimuli like porn or, or movies or books or what. And now we have difficulty responding in, in an intimate connected relationship. It may be that it's gotten to the place where sex is a task to check off your list rather than something that you um, look forward to plan uh, and, and make special. And then you may think, well, if I, if I plan for it, then it for sure will become a task. And yet there are ways we can do it without it becoming a task and just making sure. And what's important is that we not connect sex with duty or demand, but rather desire or decision. Let's say a little more about that. Most often, it's the man who, who's like the man who said, my drive is stronger and she doesn't want to please me and does it reluctantly. Well, that's because she's feeling demand and demand won't work. And also, if the woman feels like it's her duty, Christian duty or wifely duty or whatever label she puts on, so I, I, I've got to be available to the man whenever he wants it. Those do not make for a lifelong enjoyment of a sexual life. And it life. usually doesn't make the husband happy either when he functions on that system. Now, people will ask, what's the difference? We all want sex by desire. And that's fine. Yeah, and and when, when both of us desire it, and when both of us desire it at the same time, that's easy. But usually that doesn't happen that often. And so what's the difference between duty and decision? And the way I like to explain it is duty is more the attitude. It's like, oh gosh, it's been three days. I better do it or he'll be in a bad mood. Versus decision is, you know what? It's been three days. Uh, we should plan a time together that's really good for both of us and we make it fun and we enjoy each other. And let me see, when would that work into my schedule? That's the decision or you plan that for some people they just like to plan it you know once a week or twice a week yeah some for some couples you know thursday night is sex night and and that's great if that works for both of you for others that would be dreadful so uh, uh you have to work that out with each other but wherever you are in that journey we nudge you to push against the resistance and be intentional uh, maybe do an experiment if you don't believe in it say, well, from now until the end of the year, let's, let's plan it and see what happens. And to do that, we want to leave you with our formula for intimacy. And it's in more detail on your outline on the last page, page three of your outline. The first part of that formula for intimacy is setting aside 
aside 15 minutes per day. And that's the most important. Start with that. And you may say, you know, that doesn't seem like very much, but that and we're not talking about uh, 15 minutes a day for sex. We're talking about 15 minutes a day for connecting. To keep that oxytocin going and even add a little spark. So first part of that is, is some kind of connection emotionally, looking in each other's eyes and, and not deciding who's going to take the kids to soccer tomorrow, but, but anything, Sharing a word it. of affirmation or a thought or a feeling that you've had that's connecting. And something positive, not something, not working out your last pipe. But anything, and that's why thinking about positive things throughout the day can help, being aware of when you have felt good with each other. And, and if you're doing this every day, it will change. You know, some days it'll be, you know, I really thought about you today when I this happened, and it just reminded me of this and this and this, which always has been so great. Or you may think, you know, I was thinking today, or I had this feeling and so sharing those. But this formula is very prescriptive. It's very important to do it in this order. And be, because in the first one, it's connecting emotionally and eye to eye contact. Then if, depending on where you are in your spiritual journey, we know everybody's in a, in a different place. If you feel comfortable reading something together or a prayer or reading a prayer or uh, whatever it is that works for you, something inspirational. And then we get to the physical part, and that starts with a a twenty second hug. And that's a real face to face. That is a, a total. That's that's not a COVID hug. It's not a Baptist <laughs> hug. It's a it's front a to front. total body connection, and it needs to be for twenty seconds. So set your timer on your phone and see what a twenty second hug feels like. And the and reason that, for that is that we know that particularly in the woman. Well, the sex and the brain research is the basis for this formula. And the sex and the brain research shows that a 20 second hug front to front gives a big surge of oxytocin, which is that bonding hormone that makes a lot of the questions you ask could be solved by this. At least start, start there, but you have to go in this order, the emotional, the spiritual, and then the physical. And starting with the hug with the physical, and then kissing passionately for five to 30 seconds. And that's where you get a, still a little bit of spark. Even after 57 years, we can still get a little spark with the, of dopamine. So even though that's the dominant thing in a new relationship, it does keep the spark alive. So we would encourage you to determine together what, what would be a good time of day to do this. And it can't be when the kids are screaming for dinner Kids need to be. They can uh, be around. They can, yeah. It doesn't matter if they're around, but they need to be happily occupied, and then decide who's going to initiate it or take turns initiating or whatever. And then throughout the day, do a little thinking about it and planning it, and uh, be very intentional about it. And we want to underscore what the last point here is, and that is that we believe that daily passionate kissing keeps the pilot light on so that that flame can be easily ignited. Now, we... Then, then the rest of the formula for intimacy, oh, yeah. um, so there's that 15 minutes a day, then we encourage a one evening per week that's devoted to the two of you, date night, that may or may not end up in the sexual experience that has that possibility. Well, at least taking some time during that evening, not all at the restaurant, but taking some time to caress each other and spend time together being physical, whether or not that leads to arousal, intercourse, or orgasm. And then one, one day per quarter that you devote to your marriage, not just sex, you can have sex all day if you want, sure, but mainly just uh, doing something that enhances your Even marriage. Even like these seminars that are, are monthly that are being offered to the future. And then one weekend per year that you devote to the marriage seminar or uh, go off with the two of you, uh, that this is designed to build the intimacy between you. So back to that question about intimacy, um, we find that, that this may start rather uncomfortably, but then once you get into the habit of it, it can grow and, and uh, become something that is, that is fulfilling for both of you. Thank you.
There was another question. I know there's some more questions here, but one specifically that I wanted to answer, and that's that uh, your wife says, why can't we just have normal sex? And the question is, what is normal sex? Or what is she referring to as not normal sex? Right. Um, it, it, so that all depends on, on what that is, and it's hard to hard to be able to answer that kind of a question. And we know we have questions we have not answered, and just to reassure you, we will pick the answer. But we will just summarize, I mean, give you some guidelines and ending for- Well, this may connect with those yeah, questions. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. There, we have some guidelines for what is okay in a sexual relationship in marriage. And we'll just go over this very quickly because we just have two minutes left. One, is it loving? That is, is it giving? Is it mutual? Does it build the two of us? Does it create a distance in our relationship with God? Or violate any biblical principle? Is it medically safe? And then when all those are considered, we go with the most conservative spouse, allowing that one to take the small steps we talked about toward comfort with that activity, if it fits the above criteria. If it loving means not just self-centered, it's not just because it's something you want. Is it a loving, mutual experience? And then play freely within those guidelines and enjoy each other. We wanna, wanna underscore, and we hope you get this message, we strongly believe that mutual sexual joy and fulfillment can be attained by any couple when each person takes responsibility for their part and releases responsibility for the other part and then work together mutually uh, make that happen. It's so natural for each of us to think if he improved, everything would be okay. But we want to leave you with, with basically this verse taken out of sections of Ephesians 5, 1 to 3. Watch what God does and then do it. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life love and we believe that's possible for all of us as we both work on it together um it's we've pumped a lot of information at you and now we want to turn it back over to corey and marla and or, to whoever. or whoever is taking it from here but uh, thanks for sticking with us for this time thank you so much